All right, guys. So, about to get the New York swing of the Bassmaster Elite Series started, you know. And I was packing a few days ago, loading the boat. I always, after every single tournament swing or if we got a big break or even a week-long break at home or something, I always take everything out of the boat, reorganize everything, put it back in there. And I was packing the boat before we drove up north again this time from home. And I'm always bringing extra rods, stuff like that. So it made me think, if I had one rod, because I've done arsenals before of like top five rods, top three rods, but what, what's the number one rod? Like if you could only have one rod to bass fish with, what would it be? So that's what I'm gonna go into today. And the reason that it kind of sparked this is whenever I was loading the boat, obviously I'm bringing rods for every single situation. You know, I'm like, I need these spinning rods, I need a couple extras, I need bait casters for this, bait casters for this, bait casters for this, and then anything that I think I'm gonna use a lot, I always wanna bring extra rods and reels, have them pretty much ready. Cause I'm gonna tell you a story, one time, we were fishing on the St. Lawrence River. It was a practice day. And this is the reason I bring so many extra rods. I'm not gonna say who, but somebody opened the back compartment on a boat that I had and it did not have a shock on it. So back compartment opened and the wind blew it. But I mean like extremely, you know, we were in like very high winds and I had rods laying in kind of the co side. So when the back compartment blew open, broke like five rods that went like that, just one time. It just slammed them, you know, because the wind was blowing extremely hard and I had the rods kind of laying at an angle. It broke like five or six at one time like that. So that kind of stuff happens. I can slam them in the compartment lids. You know, you're gonna have a rod or two break throughout the course of a year, just regular stuff, stepping on them, slam them in compartment lids, all that type of stuff. Reels can, you know, at some point, you're gonna have some reels mess up too. So I bring extra rods, extra reels all the time. But the reason I was thinking about this exact video is Kyle I'm, brings too many rods. I'm gonna let you I know. do bring Kyle a lot. Too many rods. I bring way too many rods because I don't usually use them. You know, usually something like that does not happen. Usually I don't break a rod. You know, usually whatever I pack to bring is whatever I end up fishing with that's already rigged up and then all my extras I don't use. But there are some circumstances where I do need those extra rods from time to time. But it is, it's rare. This year and last year I'd say that I've brought way too many rods and haven't had to use the extras. But that's all right. Better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it, right? That's what that's what it says, and that's kind of what I use when I'm packing. But the reason that this, this exact concept came up is I was packing flipping rods, frog rods, you know, toad rods, jig rods to skip under docks, you know, flip a worm, light stuff, vibrating jigs, all this type of stuff. And I don't want to bring 50 extra rods, you know, I don't want to bring three of every single thing that I, that I want, you know, for a small swim bait or a big swim bait or all this type of stuff. So a lot of times what I do is I'll take my favorite rod, which if y'all have watched the videos for very long at all, y'all can pretty much comment right now and say which rod I'm going to pick. Because a lot of y'all that have watched for a long time know exactly which rod I'm going to pick. So leave a comment down below right now if you, if you can call it. See if you can call your shot real quick. But so I'm bringing like seven foot six medium heavies to throw a frog with and to flip fluorocarbon with and I'm bringing seven six heavies and I'm bringing seven three heavies and seven three mediums and all this type of stuff so but, but what I do is I'll bring one or two of all the weird rods you know my vibrating jig rod I'll bring like one extra my flipping and frog rod I'll bring like two extras but then I'll bring a bunch of seven three medium heavies and the reason I do that is it can kind of do it it can, you can kind of use that rod for literally everything. If I'm gonna flip a, a worm on an eighth ounce weight, that's the rod I use for it already. If I'm gonna skip a jig under docks, that's the rod I use for it already. A vibrating jig, it's not the optimal rod for that, but I've used it and I've caught a ton of fish on it and that's one of the rods that I throw for a vibrating jig a ton, especially when I'm skipping around docks, stuff like that. So I feel like this rod right here, the seven foot three medium heavy is the only rod, if I had to pick one rod, just one to fish an entire year this has to be it like this absolutely has to be the rod that i use for an entire year i think i could do every single technique on this including throwing a frog i, I threw a frog on it a good bit it, i don't think it's optimal for it but i do think it's definitely something that you can use in a bind to get by with and you're still gonna land a lot of fish i even believe that i can probably punch grass with up to an ounce and a quarter ounce and a half weight with this it's not gonna be optimal like obviously, like I'm saying, it's not gonna be optimal, but you can get by with it. I know whenever I was younger, fishing high school tournaments, stuff like that, 
that was before I used seven threes. I used a lot of six nines, six tens, seven footers. At that point in time, I actually used a lot of six nines and, and seven foot rods. That was before I really started using a little bit longer rod. My seven foot three rod back then was kind of a big flipping rod. That's what I used for. But uh, I threw a deep diving crankbait, like a DT20, on a six nine medium heavy one time and caught them. And I don't think I lost one all day. I couldn't throw it real far because it's not, it's, like I said, it's not the optimal setup. But in a bind, you can get by with it. Got a buddy of mine at home, pretty good fisherman. Actually, he's a really good fisherman. And that's about all he has is seven foot and seven foot three medium heavies. Really seven three medium heavies. And that's what he uses for everything, from a frog to flipping to everything. Like he, he throws everything on it. Like I'm saying, you can get by with it. So whenever we talk about optimal, you know, like uh, the, the perfect vibrating jig rod, you know, 13 Fishing just came out with a Muse rod for vibrating jigs. Got a lot of power, but still loads really, really well. We've got an Envy vibrating jig rod, seven foot four, medium heavy, moderate. Got a little bit more load than the regular medium heavy. Um, extra fast than the, than the 7.3 extra fast, which is what this is. But whenever you're talking about the optimal rod for a situation, you're talking about something that's going to land, you know, 90 to 95 percent of the fish that bite on, with that application. You know, like if I throw on a vibrating jig and I, I feel like 95 percent of the fish that bite that bait, I'm going to put them in the boat. With this rod, if it's not optimal, I feel like I'm still gonna land 85 or 90 percent. It's just whenever you get the perfect setup dialed in, you're gonna get that extra five, six, seven percent of fish into the boat, 10 percent of fish into the boat. And that's huge over the course of a year because, you know, I'm catching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish on a lot of these techniques throughout the, throughout the course of a year. And if you land another two percent of them, that means throughout a four-day tournament if I catch 25 fish a day I'm catching two more fish over the course of a tournament if that gives me three or four ounces throughout the course of a tournament that can move me up five six seven spots so having the optimal rod is a lot different than having a rod that you can you can use for everything and that's one of the reasons I, that I bring so many seven threes is it may not be optimal but it's kind of that fine-tuned point where you can pretty much do anything you want to do with it so I mean that's kind of where, where what I was thinking about when I was bringing it is like, why am I bringing two seven six medium heavies and then ten seven three medium heavies? Because if I get in a bind, I can use it for literally anything that you could ever think of. So now, the and seven for people that some people can't buy. Yeah, you can't have everything, rods. right? You can't have twenty five different rods. You can't have a you know a little flat side crankbait rod and then a medium diving crankbait rod and a deep diving crankbait rod and then a two different vibrating jig rods depending on if you want to throw it around grass or not. Everybody can't have that. And that's, like Hunter said, that's a really good point. A lot of people don't have 25 different rods. You know, a lot of people have one or two or three. A lot of people that I go fish with, even as co-anglers, they have three or four different rods. And throughout the day, they have to re-tie stuff. And, and that's the co-anglers that, you actually like. Yeah, like, that don't yeah, bring, yeah. That don't you bring, bring a tackle bag this big. Bigger and then, than me. And then a cooler this big. And then 18 different rods. I'm gonna tell you something. You gonna spend more time tangled up over here in the in the rod storage trying to untangle your Hold stuff. Time. Yeah, and then you're gonna have to trip over to get to the back deck. You're gonna trip over your your tackle bag. Then you're gonna stump your toe in your cooler. And then you're gonna get back to the back deck. And then guess what? I'm ready to go to another spot by then. Okay? Because I've I've had guys that bring a lot of rods, and literally I'll pull up to a place where. I'm only going to make three or four casts. You know, I'm only going to go 10 yards. There's one little stretch that I've I've deemed the juice, you know. So I pull up and they're like, oh man, I haven't thrown my jig rod all day today. It's at the bottom of the pile, right? By the time they get it untangled with everything, I'm like, all right, let's go to the next spot. So now the jig rod's on top, right? And then we get to the next spot and what they need next is on the very, very bottom. So. I just want to say also, I think Kyle has somehow trained me that whenever I hear the ch of the trolling motor pulling yeah. up, I'm sitting in my seat. Yeah, she has. She hears that lock disengage that holds the actual trolling motor down. And then she's pretty quick with it though. Hunter's fast. Hunter is not a uh, nuisance in a tournament. She usually catches them and she's really, really fast. Like she's really quick. And she also knows w when we're in some BS. Like if we're, if we're in some bad water, Hunter knows instant. Like I can tell. Like. We'll fish down a bank, and I'll fish. I'll fish maybe 100 yards, right? And there's there's a 10 or 15 yards stretch that's good, you know, like really good. And I'll pull up and I'll fish for 30 yards, and Hunter won't even get up. 
And then we get to the juice stuff, Hunter will get up, she'll start dobbing or, or casting or whatever she wants to do. And then we get out of the good stuff, she'll sit right back down. So she, she knows what's good water. She knows what's productive water in tournaments. And she's really, really quick and really efficient. But she don't, she don't like to stand back there and waste time aimlessly casting. We're wishing for a bite, you know? I, I, I feel like something nobody has really talked about this year is like, there's not been a lot of diversity in the tournament baits. No. No, there's not. That no one, that anybody that has won or even done well in the tournaments has caught them on. Like, yeah. there hasn't been like a jig tournament or a no. frog tournament. There ain't been a cranking tournament. There hasn't been, I don't even think there's been, I mean, a vibrate, vibrating jig played a little bit at Okeechobee. But I mean, usually through the course of a year, you see a vibrating jig or, or a chatterbait, you know, play. Or at least I mean, a, a, a top 10 in like every tournament, somebody's usually throwing one. And th this year it hasn't played very much unless I've just missed it, you know. But it's it's been a lot of because we went to Florida for, for like two. And we had a long break in March. And March is kind of that month where you can, you know, use your 7'3 medium heavy for 18 different applications and catch them on everything. And then, we, and then we've kind of missed that and then went straight to kind of some spawn type stuff and some, you know, a lot of flipping this year. A lot of people have been flipping worms and you know creature bait stuff like that a lot of that's played but for the most part it's been a lot of soft plastics this year it seems like and then some jerk baits forward face on our stuff has, has obviously played it's gonna play forever now but you're right it definitely has not been now we're up here a very versatile year country. yeah and i mean five of the tournaments you know everybody was throwing a dang some type of worm and then now everybody's been throwing a drop shot for the last three you know and th there's some other kind of weird baits that play you know but for the most part it has been a year of less diversity than normal, I would say, you know, and probably my second year on the elites, we had the most diversity that year, I would say, you know, a lot I of- I thought it was rookie year when we had the fall tournaments. Well, the fall tournaments, they, we, we had two of the fall tournaments on Chickamauga and then Gunnersville and Santee. So a lot of the same techniques played for all three of those because the grass is high on all three of those lakes. And it was kind of the same deal for three of the tournaments. And then in the spring we had, we had St. John's and we had Eufaula. So that, there, was, there was some diversity my first year and my second year. But it seemed like last year there wasn't that much diversity. And then this year there hasn't been that much diversity as far as the bodies of water that we actually go to. But, you know, anyways, the reason all of this is coming full circle, we're kind of going on a tangent. But one thing I want to say is I use a seven foot three me medium heavy. That's what I like. I like a little bit longer rod. I feel like I have a little bit more control of my bait, a little bit more control of you know, the fish, whatever I hook them, all that type of stuff. Just got a little bit more. I just like the way it feels to have a little bit longer rod. I feel a little bit more in control whenever I've got a fish on. But if you like a 6'10", that's fine. If you like a seven foot, that's fine. If you like a 6'6", six six, that's fine. If you like a 5'6", pistol grip, that's fine too. But the thing is, you kind of got to find that one sweet spot rod for you. And then kind of kind of use that for a lot of techniques because I, I feel like a lot of people, especially you know, high school kids and people that ask me a lot of stuff, a, a lot of tips on fishing and stuff like that. They get really kind of dialed in for, I need this rod for this technique. And you do to have the optimal circumstance. But the difference in optimal and suboptimal is literally, you know, 10 or 12 percent higher landing rate on, at, at most. You know, that's like the, the most you can do. And that's that's the best reel, the best gear ratio, the best line, the best rod, the right hooks for the bait, all that type of stuff. It doesn't take you from losing every single fish to landing every single fish. It takes you from landing 75 percent of fish to 90 percent of fish. And that's the difference. And that's why whenever I use this rod, I feel like I have a really, really good landing ratio for all those baits even though it may not be optical i may just be off by two or three percent so that's kind of one of those things that i feel like there's some misconceptions and it doesn't have to be a 13 fishing envy that's what i use you know 13 fishing has some news they're a little bit you know at a better price point we've got the meta reel that reel and rod which is a really really good rod and reel that actually my buddy swindle actually designed and for the price point i think those are a good bit cheaper rods i think you can probably get the rod and reel you know a complete setup of really high quality stuff for 300 or less you know for a really high quality rod and reel and then if you want something that's even more budget friendly you can go down to the you know the fates we've had the fate rods for a long time they're actually really surprising how good those rods are for the money that's a sub hundred dollar rod you can get an inception reel or the inception you know g2 or inception slide now which is 
you know, a cheaper reel. There's a lot of reels that you can use at a, at, and rods at a lower price point that, you know, like I said, it doesn't take you from landing 100% of fish down to zero. It just, it's not gonna be the exact optimal thing. You're not gonna feel the bite's quite as good. You're not gonna have, you know, quite as smooth a reel that holds up for years and years and years. But you can still get by and you can still fish. And if you take care of your stuff, it'll actually last a long time. I fished with the Inceptions all year last year that's a, that's a good bit cheaper reel i think that was a 110 dollar reel i was putting it on really nice rods because i like the rod but there was also some where i was throwing an inception on a fate you know especially for cranking and stuff like that that's a sub 200 dollar combo or right at 200 dollar combo for you know and i was using it in in you know the biggest tournaments in the world so i mean that's kind of the thought process behind it is don't get too hung up on gotta have the exact thing because you're still gonna be able to catch fish, still gonna be able to get bites, still gonna be able to land fish, even if you've just got one good all around rod, so. The most important thing is to throw at fish. Finding the fish is more important than your equipment. That's the truth. I mean, you better be thrown in front of them if you wanna catch them. And that's just point blank, you know. All of us on the elites, we use different rods, different reels, different baits, and I mean, it seems like everybody catches them on different stuff at every single tournament, you know, so. And different stuff like, I might have a worm that I like. You know, I, I have a Ned Rig, the uh, Crush City BLT that I like. Some people throw other brands. It's not really that the pig fish sees it and they're like, oh, that's a Crush City one, I'm gonna eat that. Or that's a Crush City one, I don't want that. That's not how it works. It's just about throwing it in front of the fish. We all have different sponsors, different stuff like that. And, you know, everybody out here seems to catch them really, really well. So don't get too hung up on the small stuff and think you gotta have that to catch fish. Cause you don't, you can take a seven foot rod and throw everything on it and have a great year. So, kind of just something I was thinking about whenever I was packing that, because I brought so many of these, just because if I do get in a situation where I need something, this is the one to get me through, so. Tell them where we are. We're on a small little local lake up in New York, yeah, and uh, this place has got them. I don't know if I ever fished a lake before in my entire life Plentiful. where I catch more fish than this, so. The next video will be us fishing out here and catching them. So, maybe I'll check that one out also, but. Have confidence anyway. in your equipment and throw at the fish. Throw at the fish. That's a good one. Peace out.